next question is about next year. So uh, Biden administration has been criticized for its North Korea policy, uh, maybe because there are so many distractions in uh, global politics these days, the Ukraine war and the Gaza war. So uh, next year, probably Biden administration will not do very dramatic in dealing with North Korea nuclear problem or North Korea itself. And also uh, in November, there will be a U.S. presidential election, which is a big concern for many countries, including South Korea. So do you think there will be any uh, changes or impact of uh, U.S. Uh, North Korea policy after the U.S. election? If you look at previous transition of power in the United States um, from Obama to Trump, for example, in the last year of the Obama presidency in 2016, North Korea was on a relentless course of provocations. And throughout the first year of the Trump presidency, North Korea was again on a relentless course of escalation with three ICBM intercontinental ballistic missile tests. So with two years of provocations and creating a crisis-like situation, North Korea dramatically changed the tune to a happier one in early 2018 and launched its charm offensive. And Kim Jong-un, during his New Year's address on January 1st, 2018, said he would be amenable to sending a delegation to the Pyeongchang Olympics in South Korea. And then inter-Korean talks began almost right away, one day before the North Korean delegation's visit to South Korea, North Korea announced that Kim Il-jong would be on the delegation, which created even greater excitement and expectations of genuine peace. So I think North Korea, more likely than not, will do what it has over the past two or three years, which is to be more provocative. I think Kim Jong-un feels emboldened by Putin's um, unprecedented support for him. The first meeting did not go well between the two men, especially for Kim Jong-un. He met Putin for the first time in Vladivostok on April 25th, 2019, and came out of the meeting feeling insulted because Putin told Kim at the meeting that tomorrow, by the way, I'm flying down to Beijing to attend the second Belt and Road Initiative conference. It's considered a breach of diplomatic protocol for the head of the host nation to fly out while the head of the, the um, visitor nation uh, is still in your country, almost rent him uh, like a tourist. But as we saw at their second meeting in the Russian Far East on September 13th this year, the two men look happy to meet each other again. And of course, there's a reason for that, because Putin needs Kim almost as much as Kim needs Putin. Um, we know that Putin needs ammunition, um, artillery shells and so on from North Korea and North Korea needs real help with satellite and ICBM technology. So we're living in a different world where there is unrestrained support for North Korea from Russia and China. It remains to be seen whether China has supplied um, any weapons to North Korea or to Russia, but we know that China has been uh, brazenly violating Security Council resolutions uh, that it has signed on in the past, uh, that is selling goods to North Korea, sending goods to North Korea, buying coal from North Korea, and also uh, China's share of the Russian automobile market went from 8% in 2021 to 55% this year in 2023. So China and Russia and North Korea are in the same camp just as they were during the days of the Cold War. And I think Kim Jong-un feels further emboldened to be provocative because there's no real penalty that's been meted out for North Korea's multiple ICBM tests and over 100 short-range missiles that North Korea tested um, over the course of the past almost two years now. So yes, whoever is elected in November uh, matters to Kim Jong-un as well. Uh, because Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump had something akin to a rapport, exchanging love letters, as President Trump once said, I think Donald Trump is the favorite U.S. candidate from Kim Jong-un's point of view. And Kim Jong-un has actually some means to help Donald Trump. If he invited Donald Trump to Pyongyang 
in the coming months uh, and Trump made the visit, then Trump can say, look, I have this special connection with Kim. Uh, I can bring peace and denuclearization to the Korean Peninsula, whereas Biden has been an utter failure over the past almost four years and so on. And that can be helpful to Trump's candidacy. And once, if Trump were to be president once again, then there are legitimate concerns, of course, for America's allies, uh, NATO and Japan and South Korea. Um, so yes, although we cannot predict what will happen, there are some risks that we have to not only live with, but plan for. Yeah, I think your remarks broadens our uh, policy-related imagination, how we should cope with uh, things happening next year. So do you have anything that you can suggest to U.S. or South Korean government uh, in the next year? You already mentioned that the international environment surrounding North Korea is radically changing, maybe in North Korea's favor. So what should we do? Well, I mean, I'm calling for tough sanctions enforcement. Sanctions enforcement, like domestic law enforcement, takes a lot of F manpower. You have to do surveillance, you have to investigate, you have to build up a legal case. All this is very labor intensive. And the moment you let go, everything falls apart. So even the toughest criminal laws um, on the books, if the law enforcement authorities do nothing, don't enforce them, they're meaningless. Likewise, sanctions enforcement against North Korea really fell apart the moment Donald Trump said yes to Kim Jong-un's proposition for a summit meeting. So um, over the past five years or so, sanctions enforcement has been feeble and China and Russia have brazenly violated uh, Security Council resolutions that they had endorsed in the past. That doesn't mean we have to give up on sanctions enforcement. It should be a major uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. At the same time, the free democracies in the region, South Korea can do a lot more in terms of information dissemination into North Korea. And one basic information that needs to be made almost palpable to the world at large is that the North Korean food insecurity situation near famine-like situation every year since the real famine of the mid-90s. This is all man-made and man-sustained. Many people, including defenders of North Korea in the U.S., argue that North Koreans are hungry because, because of U.S. and U.N. sanctions and climate change. These are baseless theories. You know, U.S. sanctions against North Korea until 2016 were very weak. It was not until 2016 that the U.S. actually came up with a North Korea-specific sanctions legislation. And with respect to U.N. sanctions, we know that there were no U.N. sanctions until 2006 in the wake of North Korea's first nuclear test on October 9th. Since then, there was a tough Security Council resolution, number 1718, 10 years after the onset of the famine. And by what marvel of nature does climate change every year stop right at the border with China and with South Korea? Hardly anyone in China or South Korea goes, uh, goes to bed hungry. No one is starving, basically. So if North Korea spent about $200 million to import food and distributed it equitably, no man or woman or child would be hungry. But North Korea chooses not to. And the UN has many re reports on food inse insecurity. One is the annual, the state of food and nutrition in the world. The most recent 2023 report is out. Uh, one measurement is um, the prevalence of undernourishment in the total population. North Korea for the past several years has been in the world's top five worst cases. This year it's Number one is Madagascar with 51% of the population who are hungry. Uh, number two is Somalia with 49%. And then number three is North Korea with 46%. What really stands out, I put one together, top 20 nations, adult illiteracy, the inability to even write your name, the inability to read or write a simple sentence is high as 62% 
in many countries, it's in the upper 20s or mid 30s, meaning uh, in North Korea, of course, it's completely literate. North Korea did eradicate adult illiteracy even before South Korea sometime in the mid 70s. So this is an, a, an artificial man sustained miserable situation. People living in Zimbabwe, in Sierra Leone, where illiteracy is 52%, in Afghanistan, where, where illiteracy is 62%, um, they are eating better than North Koreans. This is a shocking phenomenon that has continued for more than 30 years now. For many of us living in free societies, we have no direct experience of state-sponsored crimes like constant surveillance or arbitrary arrest and torture or political prison camps. These serious crimes are therefore harder to empathize with. They're something like an abstraction, whereas everyone has been hungry at some point by choice or circumstance. You know it's not a pleasant feeling. And this chronic hunger and physical and mental atrophy of our fellow Koreans in the North that's been going on for three decades, we need to hold somebody accountable for this serious crime. I think that story needs to be told. The people of North Korea need to be told the truth so that they come to realize how relatively oppressed, how extremely repressed they are. So we need some good information campaign as well, in addition to sanctions enforcement.